Next, I'd like to read to you the preface to the Gideon's Bible. The Bible contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its histories are true, its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, and practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It is the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's charter. Here paradise is restored, heaven opened, and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is its grand subject, our good the design, and the glory of God its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly, frequently, and prayerfully. It is a mine of wealth, a paradise of glory, and a river of pleasure. It is given you in life, will be opened at the judgment, and be remembered forever. It involves the highest responsibility, will reward the greatest labor, and will condemn all who trifle with its sacred contents. Next, I'd like to uh, start into my main talk of the day, but I'd like you to understand that uh, I think the Lord has really put on my heart in the past few nights that, uh, you know, I'm challenging people to read their Bible. And in order to read your Bible, you, in other words, in order to know God, you need to read your Bible. And I've been doing, you know, talks about different subjects and about our na nation and about um, religion and uh, Jesus Christ, etc. But um, because my challenge specifically is for people to read their Bible, I am... Uh, going to read the book of Romans over the next few days. I don't know how many capitals this is going to take. I'll talk for about 30 minutes right now. It's 12.15, so we'll say 12.45, I'll be done. And um, anyway, I'm just going to start with Romans 1, and I'm going to talk about it as I go. And uh, I just want people to know their Bible. And Romans, I believe, is the constitution of Christianity. If you can understand Romans, then you will understand what happened in Jesus Christ and what the rest of the Bible is talking about. When uh, people want to know the Christian message, message, I always tell them, read the book of Romans five, six, seven, eight times, and uh, it'll sink in, it'll sink in, and eventually you will have a good grasp of Christianity. And without that, you really don't have that basis that you need. So we're going to start right now with Romans 1.1, 1, 1, and we'll just talk as we go. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. All right, Paul was a Pharisee. Later in the Bible, he mentions his credentials. He was, you know, one of the high theologians of the Hebrew society in Israel. And um, he was actually a persecutor of the church. He uh, was going to uh, different cities and even as far as Damascus to persecute people in the church, to bring them to prison and do whatever was necessary. He even stood at the uh, feet of the people that stoned Stephen, the first martyr of Christianity. He uh, received a vision from the risen Christ and he became the apostle to the Gentiles. In fact, uh, one of the people that believed in Christ at the time was told to go and lay his hands on him so that he would uh, be able to see. He was blinded when he saw the risen Christ. And um, he said, Lord, you know, uh, this person has been persecuting the church. And Jesus Christ, his own words said, go. This is my chosen instrument to carry my message forward to the Gentiles and open their eyes from darkness to light, um, and also kings and etc. I mean, that's a misquote of the verse, but that's, that's what it says. And um, so Paul was a persecutor of the church, and overnight he became the apostle to the Gentiles. So he starts here by saying he is a bondservant of Jesus Christ. That means a servant without pay or a slave in today's lingo. And uh, he had given up all of the fame of being this uh, great theologian in Israel. He would have probably been right at the top ranking of them. He gave it all up for the sake of Jesus Christ and calls himself a bondservant of Jesus Christ. And he is called as an apostle. An apostle is a sent one. He has been sent to um, uh, the people of the world to give the message. His uh, 13 and possibly 14 books, one of them is uh, not... Uh, titled Who Wrote It, which is the book of Hebrews. Some people believe that Paul wrote that as well. But at least 13 are specifically ascribed to Paul by his own hand. And um, his message resounds to this day. He was tireless in what he did. He suffered persecution by the people that he once stood with. He was beaten. He was flogged. He was uh, shipwrecked several times. Uh, he was in danger from the Gentiles, in danger from the Jews. And this is all recorded elsewhere in the Bible. But uh, he was a great, great man of God. He had a found firm a firm foundation of the Christian message, and he was the right person. Of course, God makes no errors, but he picked the right person to bring us the message of Jesus Christ and what occurred on our behalf. 
which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So he was separated to the gospel of God, and that's what he's talking about in verse 2, the gospel of God, which he promised um, through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Now, the Jewish people would say, well, the Holy Scriptures point to us and our relationship with him. But if you go especially to the book of Isaiah and elsewhere, God says, you know, bringing my message to the Jews is too small. Uh, this is speaking of Jesus Christ. I'm going to uh, be a light unto the Gentiles as well. The whole world would be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. And this is what God did through his only, his, uh, only begotten son, his beloved son, Jesus Christ. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh. What he's saying here is that Jesus Christ was born from the kingly line of David, which is recorded in Matthew and in Luke, and then it backs all the way up to Abraham and eventually to Adam. So there's this godly line that goes all the way from Adam all the way down to Jesus Christ. He was born of David in the flesh. Okay, a promise was made to David that one of his sons would sit on that, the throne of Israel forever. This is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Uh, he is today ruling in heaven, but sitting on the throne of Israel the Prince of God. And uh, that is according to the flesh, as Paul said. That means that his human nature is revealed through this godly line that God um, had chosen even before he had created anything. Before the foundation of the world, he had chosen Jesus Christ as his son, and he had even determined that Jesus Christ would go to the cross as his son before the world was founded. So God is omnipotent. He knows all things, and he knew the right way to do this so that we would understand with absolute certainty who Jesus Christ is and what his message is to the people of the world. And declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. This is speaking of his divine nature. The previous verse spoke of his human nature. This is speaking of his divine nature. He is declared to be the Son of God with power. This is why the virgin birth is so absolutely important. Because if Jesus Christ wasn't born of a virgin, then he wasn't born of the Holy Spirit. Then Adam's sin remains in us, and we are dead in our transgressions and sins. But Jesus Christ was fully man, so he was qualified to uh, replace Adam. He's fully God, so he was capable of um, not sinning and he did not inherit Adam's sin nature. So this is what Paul is speaking about in this verse. He's declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of Holiness, meaning the Spirit of God, the triune God. All three of them are mentioned right here. By the resurrection from the dead. The resurrection of the dead proved who Jesus Christ is, that he is the eternal God and that he is the master over hell, death, and Hades. And uh, in the book of Acts, it says that it was impossible for death to hold him because he didn't sin. The wages of sin is death. It was impossible for him to die because he never sinned. And so he came back from the grave um, because of the power of the resurrection and because of the power of not sinning. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Our apostleship or our um, being called as Christians or being called as preachers or being called as missionaries, all of that is through grace. None of it is of our own effort. It is through grace that these things are done. God gives us the ability to make these choices. Now, I want to say that I believe that we still have to make the choice, but the grace is involved in it. If you don't have, say you say, I don't believe Jesus Christ is God, then what you need to do is ask for that faith, and God will grace you with that faith so that you can understand that Jesus Christ is, in fact, God. It is through grace, through Him, we have received grace. In other words, God's grace comes through Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit to give us this ability. Among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. So here Paul is saying in the previous verse, uh, grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. And then it, we're included in the next verse. We are included in the faithful through Jesus Christ. But once again, that stems back to God's grace, allowing us to be called in that way and allowing us to call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord.